Hello again. We would like to welcome you at another Transl Academy webinar. And as per tradition, be before we introduce our guests, several technical questions. As always, our webinar is interpreted in English and in Russian. And in the lower part, you can see your language menu. I've already talked about this, but I see that many people have joined us, so I will repeat. This menu is a drop-down menu. If you press it, you'll be able to choose the channel with your language. Now, I'll repeat in English in case someone is on the Russian channel now. Language at the bottom of the screen, and you'll be able to choose the language channel by clicking the language you need. Коллеги, в этот раз у нас в гостях Институт Письменных Университета Прикладных Наук. This time, our guest is the Institute of Translation and Interpreting of the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. This is one of the most advanced European schools, which has trained translators and interpreters at the highest level for over 60 years now. They have very advanced views on translator and interpreter training, and you will see that today. That is why we have actually invited them. I give the floor to my colleague, Irina Alexeyeva, who will tell you more about the ideology of the project and about our guests today. Irina, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexander. I would like to welcome everyone, everyone who joined us today, around one screen, we could say that, but of course everyone is at their place. We have absolutely wonderful guests with us today. And for the 13th time, we are hosting a webinar where we can meet new, completely unknown to us, perhaps technologies that we are not quite used to, technologies to train interpreters and translators, which are interesting for translators, for interpreters who want to improve their skills, for translator trainers, and for everyone who's interested in the profession. That was the idea of the project from the very beginning. New names, new technologies, new unknown ways. Today we have two wonderful names. We will welcome Gary Massey, the director of the Institute of Translation and Interpreting in Zurich. His research interests include translator competence and its development, translator training, and trainer training. Colleagues, you can ask any questions to Gary Massey about this. He publishes widely. He was one of the editor of such works as Bloomberg Companion to Language Industry Studies, and also a special edition of the journal Interpreter and Translator Trainer, dedicated to the questions of translation trainer training. We are very interested in this, and we think today we will get many questions. Our second guest today is Martin Kappas, lecturer at the Institute of Translation and Interpreting at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Before teaching at the university, Martin worked with one of the leading CAT tool manufacturers, and his research interests include language technologies, automatized translation technologies, and barrier-free communication. Our interpreters today, our simultaneous interpreters, are fresh graduates of our St. Petersburg School of Conference Interpreting and Translation, Natalia Dormidontova with English and Spanish, and she is the leader of our summer batch of graduates because from observers of the European Commission, she was the only one who was certified with a B combination. So she can interpret into her English B language officially for the European Union. And her second language is Spanish, which is not worse at all. And our second interpreter is Ksenia Persova, our wonderful graduate, also with the same language pair, English and Spanish. And you are in good hands in this regard today. Thank you very much, Irina. 
from translation technologies to the technologies of our project. Just a few words about the technical aspects of our project, and then we give the floor to our guests. We have already made a list of questions for our guests, which we hope help reflect all the aspects of interpreter training in the schools, all the aspects that we've already encountered and that we are yet to encounter. In the second part of the webinar, our guests today will answer all of your questions, which you can already write into the chat now, if you have any. In the lower right part of the screen, you can see a chat widget for that, and you've already used it while we were preparing. So you can ask questions while the speakers are presenting, and they will answer them. Now we give the floor to our guests, our colleagues from the Institute of Translation and Interpreting of the Zurich University of Applied Scientists. You have the floor, colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, we are here, actually, to talk about our um, our programs, our principles, and our practices, and uh, we cannot emphasize strongly enough how excited we are to be here and to be able to convey to you a few of our ideas. Who are we? Well, we have been introduced, but uh, just very quickly, just to so you can zone in on us and recognize the faces. Um, my colleague Martin, who is? Hey, hello, Martin. Yeah, hello. <laughs> I'm a lecturer at the uh, Institute here, and as was mentioned, I was, had been working in the industry before, and I do everything that has to do with um, language technology. And just getting used to this uh, system here, I, as, as was said in the introduction, am director of the IUED, uh, the Institute of Translation and Interpreting here in Winterthur in Switzerland, it's at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, and uh, I have been head of its uh, undergraduate and graduate degree programs in translation. So if you've got any questions regarding those programs, I'd be happy to try and answer them if I can. Now, just to situate our institute and uh, our teaching, uh, we are one of eight schools at ZHAW, which is the acronym, the German acronym for um, the Zurich uh, University of Applied Sciences. Um, and uh, that School of Applied Linguistics we are in has three institutes, one of which is my own. We have uh, Institutes of Applied Media Studies and Language Competence as well. And we have three state-funded degree programs of which our institute actually is involved in two, a BA in Applied Languages and an MA in Applied Linguistics. Um, perhaps important regarding our particular approaches to training, or as we like to call it, education, um, is our mandate. We have BA and MA programs, but we're expected to do a lot of applied research and development, provide services for uh, the Swiss economy, including the language economy, and provide um, CPD, continuing professional development or continuing education for people outside of the university above all professionals working in the translation sphere. Our human resources, we have 40 professional, uh, sorry, professors and lecturers working for us, 13 research associates. Um, in our programs, we've got between 50 and 90 MA students in any one year because we have a three semester program. Therefore, it uh, depends what time of year you are actually uh, looking at our statistics. We have 50 to 90 MA students 330 to 360 BA students and about 200 CPD students at any one time. We have a good staff student ratio, teaching ratio of between 10 and 12, which is pretty good. It means that our students get quite good attention from us. We have a good network. Uh, we are members of the EMT, the European Masters in Translation Network, and a member of SUTI. Um, I'm actually on the SUTI board, so that gives us a little bit uh, of, 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 of leverage, shall we say, within the community. We have above six, more than 60 international partner universities uh, within Europe and outside of Europe, and we are well networked with professional associations and commercial and institutional language service providers and language service departments. 
Now, what we'd like to talk to you about today, we can't cover everything, is to, we'd like to shine a few spotlights on, um, on five areas. First of all, our evolving MA translation curriculum. Um, we'll then look in detail at one particular transversal competence area we have called barrier-free communication. We'll look at the technologies we deploy and how we teach them. Our particular approaches to the actual teaching of translation generally, and staff and organizational development. In other words, what we do to get our trainers up to scratch and keep them up to date. Now, regarding the uh, MA curriculum, it's perhaps important to know that we have three specializations. One in professional translation, which I would like to focus on today. One in conference interpreting, which I will be obviously mentioning today and one in organizational communication, which is offered by our sister institute, the Institute of Applied Media Studies. This is important because we have a strategy that's developing that's looking at a convergence between our two professional fields. Now, regarding professional translation, um, some background here. We offer a number of languages and combinations. We are a multilingual country with German, French, and Italian as our main languages. English is a major language here in uh, Switzerland. Therefore, we offer that as well as a regular language and Spanish. On demand, we can offer Russian, Chinese, Portuguese, Dutch, Serbian, and any language really where we get a sufficient amount of interest from student groups or potential student groups. Now, the competences and knowledges uh, or knowledge that we actually like to um, train our people in, educate our people in, are obviously domain specific translation competence. And this is important, not only interlingual between languages, but also within languages, interlingually. And Martin will be talking a little bit about barrier free communication from this point of view. We're also keen to train them in language technology skills. And of course, in the specific context in which they work, they'll learn about the professional skills they need for the work market. And because we have an MA in Applied Linguistics and we are keen to educate reflective practitioners, we focus a good deal, not wholly, but a good deal on models and methods of applied linguistics applied to the real world. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we handle the questions later at the end of our session. <coughs> the evolving MA curriculum. We have, up until now, offered classic specialised interlingual translation um, in the languages I've just me mentioned. By classic, we mean basically the type of thing that I think is deployed worldwide in translator training institutes. We've noticed, however, a progressive shift in the market. And therefore, from next year onwards, we will be offering specific profiles in addition to the classic interlingual translation profile of barrier-free communication and audiovisual translation and translation management. Now, this includes the consultancy element. And the reason we've included this is because we've increasingly seen a drift towards need amongst our client base to be advised on how to translate, how to manage their workflows, what to translate, whether to use MT and whether not to use MT. In other words, our graduates are increasingly being positioned as language consultants. They can both do the work that translators need to do, but also talk about how to deploy that work in organizational contexts. As from 2021 onwards, and I talked a little bit earlier about this, we are looking to create a hybrid program for our students of translation and international organizational communication. Because here we have seen, certainly in Switzerland, a decisive need opening up for multilingual organizational communicators who know about translation and for translators who know about international organizational communication.
the type of branding, the type of marketing, type of strategic communication that organizations increasingly need in the globalized world of today. As I've said, we have been, uh, we have been adopting a repositioning strategy. Technological competence is important to us from the point of MT user skills, for instance, especially neural machine translation, post-editing skills. But our students will also have to be literate in the use of these technologies and not just use them without any reflection. So we are focusing on digital and machine translation literacy, a field that seems to be emerging quite strongly in translation studies and translator training worldwide at the moment. And as I've said before, we are keen to position our students as managers and consultants. We're in actual fact looking at the human added value. Now, of course, you may argue that humans will always be needed in the loop, and I agree with you totally, but we have to position our graduates to be able to sell themselves, given the rather excellent performance of certain machine translation systems nowadays. And where does that human added value lie? Well, we think it lies in adaptivity, in creativity, and in an ethical approach to work that, of course, machines do not possess. Therefore, we're looking to reposition our translators as intercultural mediators, as trans creators, and as consultants. And to talk a little bit about how we do that, I'll hand over now to Martin. Yes, thank you, Gary. Um, one of the fields that I think really sets our school apart from many other institutes is uh, the field of barrier-free communication. And it's, as Gary mentioned, it has to do with the intralingual uh, translation many times. And some of the methods that we present in different classes, and I'll go through the way the curriculum is structured in just a couple of slides. Uh, some of the methods are audio description, that is um, adding a, a second um, audio uh, to, to films. Typically right now this is mostly for um, Hollywood films or entertainment films so that um, uh, people with um, visual impairment or blind people can follow um, the, the content of the, uh, the movies. Uh, we do live subtitling, so subtitling of live events, live TV shows, um, but also looking at uh, live subtitling of um, classroom activities, of lectures, so that um, people with um, uh, hard of hearing or uh, they can still follow along uh, the, the lecture. And in, the, in that case, there are different kind types of um, input methods. We do talk about speech to text or keyboard based here. And I have a little picture here. This is from a conference on barrier free communication. And those two uh, ladies here with the scary looking masks are <laughs> actually dictating uh, the live subtitles um, so that they can appear on the screen and uh, people uh, with um, hearing impairment can follow the, the speaker of the conference and uh, the contents are uh, presented as subtitles on the, the screen. So this is um, that. There are also other methods, uh, things like easy to read language, plain language or citizen oriented language, it's, which is a big part of um, intralingual, sort of very classic intralingual uh, translation. There has been a market um, in uh, in Switzerland and in countries around. And what we've seen a lot is that there are practitioners uh, that start without really uh, reflecting much about um, what they're doing. So we're hoping to set a couple of standards and um, sort of try to, to help people understand what is going on really. Then barrier-free communication for uh, digital text, that means um, any website or any uh, publication uh, that needs to be presented on a screen reader or that needs to be subtitled, um, what are the techniques to do, uh, what are the requirements, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we also talk about other aspects of um, audiovisual translation, 
um, that go into the interlingual audiovisual translation, the sort of standard, uh, so to speak, traditional audiovisual translation. And the curriculum in the oops, yeah in the MA is structured in in three courses. So we have um, the first course that gives hopefully gives all our students the theoretical introduction to the relevant methods. That of course uh, is done by just uh, lectures and, and inputs, but also uh, already at the beginning we're trying to uh, have them work on exercises and hands-on assignments. And we try to supplement this by um, presentations from practitioners from the field, but also academics from other institutions so they can see hopefully a 30, uh, 360 degree view of the field as much as possible. In the second semester of that course sequence, we then uh, move on from the more theoretical to a very practical approach. There's some additional input sort of on specialized aspects of uh, the different methods. And then this is um, complemented by workshops and practical exercises for some of the, the methods that the students then themselves uh, decide uh, which ones they're interested in. And then they start doing little uh, projects that they can then also use in their portfolio to show what they, what they learned. And the third course is then sort of letting them loose, so to speak, and we try to, to acquire um, uh, projects from our from partner organizations uh, in the industry or um, the public media to get real life projects that our students can work, uh, work on and, and really work independently, of course, with the guidance from the partners and our guidance, but also um, really sort of make mistakes and learn and move on and, and see the real life um, application of what they learned, hopefully. So this is the, um, the uh, core sequence for the barrier free communication. When it comes to language technology, and that includes pre uh, machine translation and related fields, we have, um, we have three uh, courses right now. There's going to be a fourth course that I'm, I'm going to mention as well. The first one, Language Technology 1, is an almost uh, yeah, classical CAT tools course. It's supposed to build up, refresh, and deepen the CAT tool skills depending on where our students come from, whether they came through our BA. In that case, they already got a good, um, uh, pretty good knowledge of CAT tools. Um, or if we have people from other um, career paths, uh, we may have to sort of take them by the hand and lead them to a certain level. Uh, what we do in that case, it really is uh, from almost day one, we have people work independently on crew projects. Um, so they get a, a translation assignment and they have to work on that using a CAD tool uh, in small groups of four or five people. And we try to cover two different CAT tools uh, every semester so that the first one, um, they, they, we take them more by the hand and we do hope that uh, with the second CAT tool, they'll be able to learn uh, more on their own based on what they know about the first one. In the second uh, part of the language technology curriculum, we talk about, so to speak, everything else around uh, CAT tools. So we talk about markup language, XML, HTML. We talk about speech recognition, how to use it in, uh, in the translation process uh, or for other um, applications such as the live subtitling. We take a look at corpus linguistics, which also is part of the sort of frame, the, the uh, applied linguistics anyways, how to build ad hoc corpora for new topics, and we try to uh, take away some of the uh, some of the issues that people have with uh, automation scripting or, or scary things like regular expressions. So that is um, this, and we also do, of course, uh, now as everybody else does, but we were there first. Uh, talk about machine translation, pre-editing, and post-editing, and we have right now one, um, starting uh, in the next course, two courses. Uh, 
The first one is the overview with the introduction, the history, how to evaluate machine translation results. We talk about pre-editing, how to write for machine translation, how to post-edit uh, machine translation, how to make most of the results, and how to integrate machine translation into the, so to speak, traditional workflow. And we have here a picture of how we hope that um, Post-editing as such is not going to happen anymore, but it's going to be more uh, integrated into the, the workflow. And starting uh, in the next uh, course, we're going to have a new uh, course that uh, deals with machine translation, language technology, and language service provision. And in that case, we will talk a little more about implementing machine translation for a given organization, how to collect the data, how to prepare and, and manipulate the data ahead of time, train an engine, and then uh, see what kind of, um, how good the output is and what has to be done in order to, to improve the results and what other tools need to be integrated and also how to uh, um, sell um, the, the results to potential customers. So yeah, this is um, the overview of those two parts of the curriculum, and I'll hand back to Gary, who will tell you a little more about some of the other interesting aspects. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, and Martin has already mentioned some of those uh, aspects, um, which I'd like to now put in the uh, framework of our particular approaches to teaching. Um, if you think about teaching, ultimately, or teaching translation, ultimately, there are four main pillars. There is a product orientation, in other words, we look at what students produce and we look at quality from that perspective. But there's also the process perspective, how people produce particular products, how the, how the product itself comes about. Now, of course, we think that this is an important aspect of training too. And of course, when you are actually teaching, you're teaching both individuals, but you can teach individuals as interacting actors within groups. And this is precisely, it's those two elements at the bottom of the graphic that actually we are, shall we say, most proud of and we feel that we are doing in a particularly innovative way. Regarding the training of um, translators um, and the process-oriented training, what we have been doing is deploying increasing amounts of screen recording and eye tracking in our curriculum. In other words, students record themselves as they are actually producing their translations so that we can have a look at it. If we have the eye tracking and the time for it and the facilities available, we can also to do eye tracking experiments to look at where they look when they're actually translating. This is particularly useful, for instance, for courses like audiovisual translation to see if the students really are looking at the intermodal aspects of audiovisual translation or simply looking at the tool itself. But you don't really always need this technology. You can have students sitting together and just observing each other and the way they do things in class. You can get them to comment on the way in which they have been working, the way in which they are working, and you can get them to comment on each other's performances. You can get them to assess themselves from the product perspective, to assess the way in which they have been actually tackling a particular translation. For instance, when they review their own screen recordings. And you can do the same in a peer feedback scenario. You can get the students to talk about each other's recordings. Ultimately, of course, there's a teacher involved, and the teacher, him or herself, can actually give feedback on the recordings, present perhaps his or her own recordings, and produce an assessment on that particular basis. This is something that we are increasingly deploying, deploying in our programs. We have set up dedicated projects to look into this, action research projects, so that we can see and evaluate the deployment of these new methods in our curriculum. Um, the results have been very, very positive, both from the student and the teacher perspective. This is just a, a screenshot from a particular process 
uh, during an eye tracking uh, intervention that we had during a particular course. We asked the students to produce a particular set of subtitles uh, using eye tracking and then review that. And then we looked at the learning effects. Um, again, very positive. Here, what you see is uh, that small red dot actually does show that this particular student was looking at the picture while doing the subtitling um, and, and managing all the tools that are surrounding that particular um, subtitling uh, section. Um, but it's not always the case. And we can individualize our feedback to students on this basis, not just looking at the product, but actually looking at the way in which that product, product has come about. Another special approach, which is actually something we've adopted, we adopted long ago and has become now more or less a standard in our field, as you all know, is collaborative learning, authentic experiential learning. In other words, situated learning, students working on particular projects brought in by external, cl external clients or external organizations. The client is often present accompanying the process, talks about the process, gives the student feedback on the process of collaborative translation. The students will work in groups, as Martin said, for instance, on, on certain cat tool exercises or, or projects. And we will, of course, scaffold that. In other words, students at BA level cannot necessarily cope with everything all at the same time. But by the time they're up to our MA level, we more or less leave them alone to sort themselves out. And they learn an enormous amount from this. Professionals are involved. Either our own teaching staff, many of whom are active on the professional market or have been active on the professional market, or we get externals in to become involved in these scenarios. And of course, there are always technologies involved as well as the clients. What this graph shows is the result of a fairly thorough action research project we conducted on a collaborative translation project involving the deployment of tools and all sorts of all manner of, 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 of aspects of the modern translation profession. And just one of the results, which I found very gratifying, but perhaps a little bit surprising, was that when the students were asked directly, but also when they were recording in their learning journals where they learn most, they're telling us that they're learning most in these actual scenarios, in these collaborative scenarios, not from the teacher, not from the client, but from their peers. This, of course, reinforces our view that a collaborative, process-oriented approach to teaching can reinforce learning in a very, very positive way. Which brings me to another aspect, the final aspect we'll be discussing today, which is staff development, teacher training, teacher education. Because if you think about it, in the same way that the students can learn from each other, and about themselves by adopting a particular collaborative or process-oriented approach. Teachers themselves can do the same. They can learn from observing their students, about their students, but also perhaps a little bit more about themselves and the way they should deploy their particular teaching strategies. And at the same time, of course, through the deployment of action research projects, where teachers are actively looking and experimenting and changing and trying out new approaches, the institution itself is learning a lot about the way in which our teachers are teaching and our teachers are learning. In other words, we have a very holistic approach to teacher training. But that has to be directed. That has to be put in a proper context. We need toolkits. Now, many of them are around, and I found it quite astounding that in translation teacher education and interpreting teacher education, these do not seem to be particularly well known. But there are organizational learning models that I think we could all adopt, and we are beginning to deploy at our institution. 
we need to create supportive learning environments, not just for students, but also for the teachers and the staff. To create concrete learning processes and practices for our staff and also for our directors, for instance, myself. And we need a leadership that reinforces that learning. It sounds simple, and indeed it is, but very few seem to adopt this approach. We, on this basis, have decided to issue a CPD directive, Continuous Professional Development Directive, aimed at educating our teachers. Of course our teachers have specialist knowledge, otherwise they wouldn't be where they are. But not all of them have tertiary teaching skills, and so that could be honed. Some of them, especially the newer teachers, are not used to the institutional context in which they are working. That itself becomes a vital element in their development if we channel it and teach them properly. Research and transfer competence is quite important to us, simply because the reflective practice that truly adaptive, highly developed experts in translation need requires a view of the profession that involves researching and looking at the profession from outside. Of course, all our professionals, if you're teaching translation, need knowledge of professional practice. That too, I think, can be trained up because some of our staff come with us with ex superb knowledge of research techniques, superb knowledge of what we would call linguistics, translation studies, but are not necessarily au fait with the professional world. On this basis, the basis of this particular competence, um, uh, competence model that we've developed, we can individualize the particular needs of our staff and get them to develop their particular needs. And I'll talk a bit about this later in the questions. But we found that alongside action research, which is the fulcrum really, and I've mentioned this, the fulcrum of our development of teacher skills, not only as teachers, but also as people involved in teaching translators in professional realities, we want, our, we want to facilitate and incentivize their development by using our own resources. If we have experiential learning scenarios and we have teachers who are not particularly au fait with the professional world, why not get them involved in experiential learning together with students? Why not have theses written on, on profession-oriented studies, profession-oriented research? The teachers themselves can learn a lot from that. I myself recently supervised a thesis on transcreation in the local Zurich environment and learned an enormous amount from my student. We have established exchange forums for teaching, research and professional practice. In teaching, we have something called in German a digitales Basselzimmer, which is best translated, I think, as a digital hobby room. Here, we coach individual teachers in their digital needs. How do they create e-examinations, for instance? They come along to this forum, physically sit together with experts who coach them in this. We also offer professional mentorships, job shadowing and freelance work for those who do not actually have professional practice in translation. Finally, team teaching is a great way of bridging the theory practice divide, putting a professional, a practitioner together with a theorist. The results are very good. And finally, from the perspective of teachers learning themselves and students learning at the same time, we have had great results from combining our standard MA programs with CPD offerings, our continuous professional development offerings, because again, we have a number of professionals from the world outside who can help not only our students, but also our teachers themselves. So that, in essence, is that. Thank you very much indeed.
Ну что, мы приступаем к вопросам. Now we are moving on to the questions. The first question is probably addressed to Gary. You are a specialist on training translators, first of all, and you are part of EMT. What information in linguistics should a translator know? Could you list five of the main areas? question actually is a very very good question and I think um, I would start by saying let's talk more about applied linguistics rather than linguistics simply because uh, we need I think in translator training and translator education <coughs> theoretical models research methods problem-solving strategies and mediatory procedures that address real-world issues confronting society, its individuals, its communities, and its organizations. So we need to be focused on the real world. Now, within this broad field of applied linguistics, I would stress first, pragmatics. Doing things with words. <coughs> Communication in action. Communication as individual action, but also as social action. Secondly, I think the translators of today and the future would need intercultural communication with a focus on intercultural pragmatics. Within and across language cultures, interlingually and intralingually. I think this is, these, these are two key elements here. Now, with specific relation to or regard to translator competence, um, cognitive translation studies, I think, are vital within the framework of cognitive linguistics. In other words, an approach to translation studies that looks at the way in which people translate from a point of view of second generation cognitive science, exploring the roles, the needs and the competences of the human actor in socio-technical networks. I think this is important, so cognitive translation studies. The fourth area, functionalist and user-centered approaches to translation which extends to such notions as uh, user experience and audience design. Again, the tr translator of today, the professional of today and tomorrow needs this. And finally, there is an emerging field. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction. I can <laughs> show you the, uh, the volume itself. I'm not plugging it, but there is an emerging field of language industry studies. And this has a strong emphasis on socio-technical systems and emerging technologies. And I think these five areas are very important for the training or the education, shall we say, of future translators. Uh, thank you very much for the answer, Gary. And the next question, what pros and cons do you see in the division between training interpreters and translators. Is there something positive about it? And perhaps there are also some negative aspects. If we divide these two types of education. It's again a very, very good question. Um, as a translation, translation teacher, I always saw a huge advantage in my translators, translation students, being introduced to interpreting techniques, simply because those interpreting techniques um, help the students to translate messages rather than words, to translate the fundamental idea behind the text rather than the surface manifestation. Um, being forced to do so, for instance, in uh, on-site translation is a very, very valuable skill to learn, not only to become an interpreter, but also to understand how translation fundamentally works. So I think that is very important. Um, we are actually thinking of creating, from a professional perspective now, a combined um, strand in our MA uh, that would involve professional translation and dialogue interpreting, not high-level conference interpreting, but dialogue interpreting, which extends the 
range of skills of our graduates so that they can cope with interpreting and translation in more community-based settings. Um, but I still think we have to distinguish between high-level interpreting skills and translation. They are very distinct sets of competences. Um, strategically, technologically, for instance, interpreters go about their job in a completely different way from translators. There are overlaps, as I said, but at the high level, I would certainly suggest separating the two. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting answer. Thank you, Gary. And now a question to both Gary and Martin at the same time. In your opinion, what should a translator and interpreter trainer know first of all? How should studies be structured and what is the minimum term of studies? Well, again, a uh, very interesting question, one that we've been thinking about here uh, for a long time. Uh, yeah, and, and as Gary already, I think, uh, mentioned in his uh, uh, introduction, uh, the, uh, an eff effective teacher needs a, a dual profile. He has to uh, be an uh, experienced practitioner, familiar with the field, with the market needs, and so on and so forth. But um, he or she should also be able to reflect on the theoretical methods and uh, models that, that are behind um, translation and linguistics and language. So I think um, uh, it's neither just a theoretical nor just a practice-oriented um, uh, approach that, that will, will, will help us. And, and if you can, uh, also as Gary pointed out, we try to complement, if we have uh, team teaching, we try to complement the two different profiles, or, well, they must not necessarily be different, but we try to make sure that um, in the course, uh, in, in, what, in a given course, we always have the two, um, the two aspects, but also we try to work on continuing education measures so that um, people who come more from the theoretical, reflective side will get a, a good idea of the industry and the other way around, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, as for the course design, maybe I'll uh, sure. Sure. I mean, pass to, to Gary. Yeah, I've, I've been involved in curriculum design and, and, um, and, and the BA and MA programs for a long time. And of course, you know, you can, in an ideal world, you wouldn't be involved with um, institutional conditions and national regulations, but we all are. And uh, the, the, the course design, the duration, the weighting of, of, of courses is dependent on local regulations and local expectations up to a point. Our MA, for instance, has only three semesters, and we would really need four. Uh, we can't do anything about that, um, um, both for conference interpreting and professional translation. It would be great to have another semester. We don't have that. Um, Above all, though, I would suggest definitely for, for translation and interpreting, we need a master level uh, qualification. Um, only then do you have the expertise and the reflective potential to actually become a translator, which is an extremely, and an interpreter, which are extremely demanding professions. So definitely an MA level course after a three-year BA. Um, anything else would be, I think, inadequate to, um, for the market, basically, nowadays. Um, as regards the balance of the program, I think we've got it pretty much right. Um, in our MA, um, we have approximately one third of our credits, including the thesis devoted to reflective practice, in other words, models and, and methods of applied linguistics, and two thirds devoted to practice. Um, not in the sense of repetitive practice, but the professional world, working collaboratively, working in a process-oriented way, but also presenting a product that has to be of the quality to be acceptable for um, the market. I think I hope that answers the question. Uh, the next question maybe is not uh, 
the questions that the schools like, but uh, it um, can tell us about the level of the school. It's the statistics of employment. Do you have any statistics? Uh, when it comes to graduates, and at what level do the uh, graduates work? Um, can you, um, are you proud of anything in particular? Should I answer? Yes, sure. yeah, okay. Um, yes, uh, we, we, we've got a graduate tracking system that we put in place actually five years ago. And over the past five years, um, we've seen quite, quite good results. Um, just to explain the system, what we do is we survey graduates when we can get them, access them, of course. I mean, not all of them want to be bothered after they've graduated, but those who, who leave their addresses, we can actually uh, get in touch with. We survey them. Well, the idea is that we serve them one year after their graduation, five years after, and ten years after graduation. It's called a graduate tracking system. Um, We've only got data on the first year after graduation over the last five years. 89% um, have a job, which is a good thing. 50% um, are employed, in, employed by companies, large organizations. 28% work as freelancers and employees. And 11% work as freelancers alone. Their income seems to be satisfactory. 87% have a job directly related to translation and interpreting studies. Now, this can be translation, interpreting, revision, post-editing, our core activities. But many work as translation managers and translation project managers, um, which is why we're beginning to evolve the curriculum slightly differently. And some are even working as copywriters and language or language mediation teachers. But they, they, the, the results are pretty good. We're, we're pretty pleased with them. We'd like 100%, but, but it's not always possible. Oh, by the way, just to a comment on the return rate, uh, it's a 60% return rate, which is really not bad for graduate surveys. And the question from me is the director from, of the school, Gary, uh, you're the director. My question is to you, how do teachers confirm their qualifications? How do trainers, how do trainers confirm the qualifications? How is the uh, qualification confirmed at your school? And uh, to tell you the truth, over the, up until a few years ago, we weren't very systematic in this, but now we've got a very robust recruitment policy, and we've got that CB, CPD directive in place for all our teaching staff that I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, first of all, um, new lecturers in translation must have professional experience, both as translator and educate, translators and educators, but they should also have an educational qualification and an MA in linguistics or translation studies. Now, it's not always possible to get exactly the person. We have a mother tongue rule, by the way. All our teachers only teach in their mother tongue. And uh, it's not always easy to get somebody who ful fully fulfills that uh, requirement. So what we will do is we might take somebody, perhaps without the professional experience that we need, and say, you can have the job on a probationary period for two years, but we will expect you to translate X number of pages on the freelance market or to have a mentor to help you to get into the professional market. That's the first point. Secondly, as I said, the CPD directive is designed to bridge above all the divides between professional translation skills, institutional knowledge, teaching skills, and scientific research knowledge applied to teaching. So. All our members of staff have set every year obligatory professional development goals to address gaps in their individual profiles. There'll be an analysis of their profile with their line manager, and on the basis of that analysis, at least one goal for their target setting for the year will be a professional development goal. This we're instituting this particular semester. Uh, uh, another question. 
What are you particularly proud of in your system of education? What are you proud of in your system of education? The process-oriented teaching and the collaborative approaches, but above all, the process-oriented teaching. Um, I'm also very proud of what Martin's able to do. Yeah, I think our uh, we are in a very good position in terms of technology teaching. Uh, we have the infrastructure. We also have the people to teach um, the, the technology tools and all the the questions around technology, how to use it. With, we have a lot of uh, faculty with a critical mind uh, towards technology, positive and a little more more critical than just critical. Uh, and what we also do have is um, uh, there's a we were lucky enough or or we were hardworking enough to get a project, a state funded project that will help us to. Uh, uh, develop the, the digital skills of uh, the individual teachers, bring people up to new methods that will allow us to a keep up with the digital advances, but also use uh, digital media and uh, digital uh, well technology in general in the classroom um, and try to bring new methods into the classroom. Dear colleagues, what schools do you cooperate particularly closely? I know that you're open to all schools, but who are your main friends? Friends, but we certainly cooperate with people. No, 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 but we have some very good friendships around. Of course, we have the EMT and SUT network, which helps us enormously with our networks. Um, and we've got these 60, 60 partners or so wor worldwide. Um, but at the moment, we're negotiating dual degrees with partners in the UK and Ireland. And we're very open to the dual or double degree system simply because the three semesters that we're offering our students are fine to educate them for now and for what we see as the future. But for instance, if they want to do a bit more in the computer linguistic side, why not have a dual degree or a double degree so that they can do a degree with us and then go off to Ireland and with a top up, get a second degree. So that we're looking at that. We're beginning to develop those partnerships on the educational level. We also regularly work together with the German, Belgian, French and Chinese institutions. Um, I won't name names because for obvious reasons, but uh, certainly with Germany, Belgium, France and China, we have good relationships. And we have research cooperation agreements and projects with our colleagues in Geneva. Um, it's very, very unusual that I'm often, uh, I often meet my colleague from Geneva in Brussels rather than in Switzerland. But uh, we do have contacts with our Genevan colleagues at the FTI at the University of Geneva. Um, and we have uh, research agreements and projects going on with universities in Ireland, in the UK, in Germany, Brazil, India and China. What would you like to change in your system of training the interpreters and translators? You've just said what you're proud of, but what would you like to change? Um, what we're, I don't think there's anything like in this one thing that we want to completely turn upside down. But what we're trying to do is to really keep updating our uh, well, the digital skills, we have to make sure that um, te teachers uh, and, and everybody on board um, has the digital skills to a understand the changing world, but also uh, deliver the, the content uh, in new ways because people do uh, expect or students often expect uh, contents to be available from wherever mm -hmm. they are and not really be bound on being uh, having to be present. Um, learner's autonomy, so we, we may have or we probably will have uh, to look a little more at individual uh, individualized education and uh, try to, to tailor certain uh, contents to, to specific needs here. Mm -hmm. And sort of on the other end, uh, 
with all the digital uh, advances, uh, we really try to make sure that the students um, don't just blindly take that and run with it, but um, we want to make sure they understand the, uh, the human added value in transcreation, inter intercultural mediation, and consultation that can only be done by humans. And that is something that I think we still have to emphasize a bit more than, than we, we do it in the current, uh, at the current state. I agree. As for your native language, how do your students develop their native language skills? What uh, have you done for that? Country um, where we've got three, well, actually four uh, languages, but three of them we could say are, are languages of. Uh, of, of, of greater dissemination, uh, German, uh, French, and Italian, and English, of course, is very strong here. So we can pick and choose. We have a um, an entry level test in our BA that demands that all students have C1 level before actually entering our program in all their languages. Now, of course, sometimes it might be a little bit lower, B2, but it's pretty high, their level of competence. And we offer in the BA kind of text production uh, and grammar and language courses to get them up to scratch. At MA at level, we don't offer specific language training. Uh, we assume that they will get that through their translation work and the professional skills that they are learning. And we insist on them having C2 before they come in. Um, as a rule, exceptions are non-regular non languages, such as Chinese. There we cannot really expect C2 level or anywhere near that type of level. Um, the rationale being that if they have Chinese, they're going to find work anyway and be able to develop that because it's a very, very niche product um, at the moment. Chinese, German as a combination doesn't really exist in any broad way in, in, in Switzerland anyway. So, yes, we, 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 we don't train at MA level language skills because we assume them to be there already. Could you tell us, as you know, as many of you probably know, and as Irina mentioned in the beginning, I participate in the translation industry as well, and I'm a director of a company. Therefore, my question, do you have established links with the translation market, with the industry, so with future employers? If yes, how did you implement that? We have good links. Um, the first level of links is really with our, and I'll give the yeah. pass over mm -hmm. to you because yeah. you're actually from the industry and yeah. you, can, you can talk a little bit more about that, but we certainly have links with professional associations uh, in Switzerland, first of all. Um, and we get people from the professional associations to come in. Many of our teachers are members of those associations, and we get representatives of the associations coming in and teaching our students um, uh, professional skills. Um, we have good links uh, with the Swiss Federal Chancellery and also with the European institutions. Switzerland is outside of Europe. It's not part of the EU, but we have nevertheless have very good links with European institutions and, of course, with international organizations, many of which have a headquarters or at least one uh, a particular branch in Switzerland. Um, we have conducted re research, uh, service provision, educational and CPD projects with all of them. We've, we, for instance, go and train the, uh, the translators at the Swiss Federal Chancery in post-editing uh, and things like that. So we have very, very good ties there. And um, some of our students recently, our students just completed uh, another terminology project, for instance, for the World International Property Organization. Um, so we, we have a lot of that, those links, both in education and research. We also did research, for instance, with the European Parliament on ergonomics. So we're very well integrated there. Martin? Yeah, and we, uh, in terms of the <clears throat> technology and technolo technology providers, we do have uh, 
partnership with most of the leading manufacturers. Um, we try to bring in uh, people from those manufacturers, but also other experts from the field, sometimes on a just personal knowledge base, but other times it's a more institutionalized connection through a partnership program. And it always helps to uh, bring the outside perspective uh, in, in those things, um, in those cases, so that the students see it's not just something that the school requires, but it is what the market needs and what the market wants. And um, we're very happy to have those good ties and being located in a reasonably I mean, very central so that um, many organizations uh, are able to, to come and, and, and visit. Colleagues, this question is the second to last, and it is a rather painful question, a very important one for our educational system. Theory of translation. How much is needed, and is it needed at all? How do you believe in your school? If it is needed, then what kind? It is a it is a painful um, it is a painful question, um, and it depends what you consider theory to be. Uh, if, as I said at the beginning, theory is considered to be models, methods, strategies, and routines to address applied problems, then I think it's a very very valuable component to extend the purview of our reflective practitioners. And I think I cannot emphasize too much that there has to be a distinction between routine activity. In other words, the concept that you can repeat certain actions, you can learn by rote and repeat certain actions, and the type of adaptive, creative type of activity that translation and interpreting are. Um, we are training adaptive experts, and those adaptive experts need to be able to reflect on their situation and change their situation and take an influence on the industry and take an influence on the processes of mediation themselves. And to do that, you really do need a background that goes beyond the pure application of practice. You need to be able to reflect on that practice. And so, although I'm, I think there are theories that perhaps go too far, I think anything that promotes in an applied way Reflective practice is very, very useful, um, but I wouldn't overweight a program with it. I think it's perfectly adequate if a quarter or a third of your program is devoted to that. Martin? Yeah, I think um, since I'm more on the technological side, uh, I, I, I'm not in that close contact with it, but I do think a certain way of reflecting and uh, problems, analytical skills that come along with um, some of the theories are, are definitely necessary so mm -hmm. but um yeah but i think that the one third that we have is a, i think that's a that seems seems very good uh, another question in your opinion is it possible to create universal criteria to assess a completed translation? And which parameters are most important? Which are involved in your system of translator training? There are many systems in the industry, for example, Taos, who developed their system of assessing translations. There are others, as well as, as LISA Lisa, this one also has a certain set of criteria. Would it be all right to use these for future translators to get used to this evaluation that will be used in the industry later? Or perhaps we can forgive some errors if these people are still translation students or beginners. Um, I certainly think that the metrics that are involved, that TORS, TORS dashboard, for instance, uh, we're looking at um, these metrics that are derived largely from machine translation, um, or systems or the deployment of machine translation, 
in, in their origin, uh, certainly have their place and they really work in industry. We also have industrial standards that we have to abide by. I agree with that. But evaluating what a particular translation is, is a very tricky business. And I come back to the concept of fit for purpose. Um, in my opinion, there are two vital criteria. We've got the client and what the client wants, and we've got the audience and what the audience needs, not wants, but needs. And I think those two things have to be critically central to any evaluation system that's developed. Often the client, him or herself, is not aware of what's needed for effective audience aware, risk-free communication. And I think risk is very important here. We'll come back to that later. But um, I really think that that beyond the quality standards, the, the attempt to almost automate some kind of quality standards, we really have to look at communication from a pragmatic point of view. It's, it's, it's moving goalposts. Every communication act is unique in its own situation and can only be evaluated in terms of that situation. So that particular, that's, that's my particular take on that. The concept of risk, I think, is very important as well. And perhaps, and this is a suggestion on my part, rather than any fully thought out approach, perhaps something in the, perhaps something based on risk management would be the way to go in future. Because first of all, I think it's good for the industry to actually be able to say to people, look, translation that is not properly done is full of risks. It's full of reputational risks. It's full of liability risks. It's full of financial risks. And therefore, and this is being done by people in Germersheim, Carmen Canfora, and, uh, and uh, Angelika Ott Ottmann, I think, are, are the two leading exponents there. They're trying to place um, quality assessment on the basis of risk management assessment. And I think that's a very good move. That's a very good move both for the industry and for the reality with which, what translation as a communicative, communicative act is. But perhaps you know more about these, these MT metrics and the blur metrics. We, we do talk about all those metrics and, well, there's for one thing the, the machine translation metrics, but they are often used more for evaluating the machine translation engine, so they do not really have that much to do with the uh, the reality of translation, but even the, the TOS or the, the LISA metrics, uh, as they're partly built in, in some of the CAD tools, we try to sort of analyze how to configure them. But there is, uh, and I think that goes in the direction that, that Gary has mentioned, that it sort of seems to almost make it look too easy to evaluate whether a translation is good or not, and that sometimes may give the client that possibly doesn't even necessarily know uh, what they need. I'm sorry, but that seems to be the case at times. Uh, uh, but if you get a score and that score is lower than your threshold, then that's out. Whereas maybe um, whatever the, the client asked for, whatever he or she needed, was maybe not even uh, what, what was in fact needed. So I think uh, it, it, it's good to understand and to, to see how those things function, but I don't think they, they work as a sort of like a spot on um, hit or, I mean, this is, this is the, the way to go or uh, evaluation of a, of a translation. Gary, this is amazing. A wonderful idea of a flexible approach with changing goalposts and risk management. I believe that this is something that our listener have, listeners have never thought of. Thank you for such a unique answer. And now we are moving on to the questions from our participants. The first question is actually related to your answer. Katerina is asking us, is it true that you do not fully agree that a competence-based approach to translator training is optimal and you have your own concept? Could you tell us about it in a few words? Based approach. Uh, I think that it's dangerous to uh, 
categorize and com compartmentalize um, competences simply because I tend to agree a little more with my colleague Don Kerali in this respect, that if we do that, we run the risk of losing that emergent um, aspect of learning that is present in a holistic approach. In other words, yes, of course, we can stage and scaffold our approaches and use a competence-based curriculum. So, for instance, we can, for instance, weight uh, research competence a little, bit a little more highly at the beginning of a program and then wait for it to develop and everything to come together at the end. Um, we only have three semesters and the competence-based approach would really require a lot longer. I think what we should do is make uh, students aware of competence models that exist um, and we ourselves, our teachers, are fully aware of these, these models. But I, I believe in more integrated um, scenarios, I must say, um, though I do not. I mean, Maria Gonzalez Davis's excellent work on multiple voices in the classroom. That has been a huge influence on the way I teach, certainly, and the way others teach. So there is a place for both approaches, but I would tend towards a more holistic, um, emergent approach. Question from Olga. A tricky question, I would say. She's asking you, to highlight three main qualities for an interpreter and a translator, if they are different. Yes, well, I mean, qualities, quite beyond the linguistic um, and, and professional competences, I think a major quality is self-efficacy. Um, this is beginning to emerge as a research object as well. You've seen in a lot of reports that the, basically, the confidence in tackling and, um, and, 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 and the self-confidence, the way in which you project yourself, you look at yourself as a confident um, translator and interpreter. I think that is absolutely central. Beyond the linguistic skills, of course, that we have and beyond the, the, the translation skills, empathy, I think, is absolutely vital as well. Empathy from the point of view, not only just of being able to understand an opposite number, for instance, but also with a view to interpretation, kind of hermeneutics, the ability to understand what somebody actually means in a given situation. So I think that's, that's they, they would certainly be two of my top uh, criteria. And of course, given uh, these, these are, I know these are all soft skills, but I, I do consider them to be uh, vital. Um, the third major skill beyond, as I said, the, the, the hardcore um, uh, uh, linguistic and, and, and translational skills would be, I think, um, social interactive competence, um, the ability to interact properly and to, to monitor yourself in those interactions. That's a fourth, I suppose, self-regulation. Sorry about that. I was put on the spot with three, so I've given you four. Alexander, another Alexander, not the moderator, asks, how relevant is the issue of the dominance of the English language for your country? Is uh, uh, the ethnic uh, languages, minority languages, in dem are they in demand? Are there any issues uh, in relation to that? It's a very important one. I mean, actually, my mother tongue is English, as you've probably heard. Um, and I would be the last person to say that, uh, you know, there should be linguistic hegemony of English over the world. Um, it just so happens that it is the lingua franca. And I think it, um, I think there's a danger in that. Uh, there are dangerous implications for multilingualism that come around, uh, that emerge from that. Um, that's why I think translation is so important because translation gives you the opportunity to actually bypass uh, lingua franca, to actually say, look, no, 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 no. Our language and our language policy insists that we have in, in, in Switzerland German, French, and Italian on an equal footing. Um, luckily, there are legal requirements in, 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 in Switzerland that say that this must be so, that every act of 
Parliament has to be translated that every citizen has the right to access documentation, key documentation, in his or her mother tongue. I think that's absolutely vital. But I see that as a problem. And another problem from the translational perspective of English as a lingua franca um, is, of course, that um, it's not always very easy to understand lingua franca English. Um, and I think it can lead to very dicey and critical, risky situations. So I fully, fully understand the, the critical nature of this. We've been, we do have projects on ELF and the effect of ELF on translation, cognitive load amongst translators and interpreters. Um, and it's absolutely clear that English as a lingua franca presents a, a, a cognitive problem to, to the translators, but also I think a social problem um, because it will or could if it's not carefully regulated, if we don't have language policies in place in certain countries, could lead to the endangering of local languages and put people at a serious disadvantage. Um, therefore, I like the EU's approach here to multilingualism, with every single language having equal status. Of course, there are working languages for practical reasons that are used at the EU, but ultimately, nobody questions the right of every individual, be it a Maltese citizen or a German citizen to communicate and be communicated with in his or her own language. Martin? Nothing to add. I mean, it's, yeah, one hears these anecdotes about uh, uh, Swiss German and the French speaking German to converse in English at times, but yes, um, uh, I think it is, is really important that um, everybody can get all the information that he or she needs in his or her own language. And I think one of the factors is, of course, that some of the uh, larger organizations that are here in Switzerland, mm. they have English as their working language, international organizations, even some of the financial institutions. Yes, really and important. obviously a, a number of expats come in, um, but um, yeah, I, on a daily basis, um, I don't, I don't see it as a no. threat yet. Swiss German is uh, alive. I don't go that much into the French-speaking part, but yeah. So. But it has, I mean, it's a good question. Sorry to intervene, but it is to do with power relations. And what I find so fascinating in the Swiss example that you mentioned is that uh, the, the, the French speakers and the German speakers will use English as a lingua franca simply because of the power relations. They don't want to be put at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis their opposite numbers. I find that an interesting development. So in a sense, you know, the lingua franca can be helpful, obviously, but uh, it, you cannot go too far. No. I'll try to unite the questions just to save the time. There was a question from Olga concerning the audiovisual translation. And uh, she asked this question just seconds before you started talking about audiovisual translation. That's why part of the question related to studying, uh, to teaching audiovisual translation, uh, part of that was al already answered. The next question, how is this method of, uh, of teaching audiovisual translation from translation in general is different? And the second question, uh, from another viewer. It feels like audiovisual translation has a bad reputation because it's some kind of reputation of a translation that is underpaid. Doesn't it seem to you that uh, machine translation is getting the same reputation at the moment because uh, many clients tend to underpay this kind of work? So these two questions concerning audiovisual translation and machine translation. So what Gary has been mentioning all along, so in the end, uh, our graduates have to establish themselves as the experts, consultants, that hopefully will be able to defend why uh, certain prices or certain processes are just not and, and again, that would go to the, back to the risk why uh, certain processes and, and uh, uh, payment rates would just not lead to a quality that is acceptable or that or would lead to a quality that uh, 
just really poses a, or brings a, the, the client to, to risk. And um, yeah, we, we see that all along. I mean, obviously, um, our graduates also uh, are aware of, uh, or our students are also all aware of machine translation and uh, how some of the bigger media uh, um, companies are trying to streamline or, or mm -hmm. change the audiovisual translation process. Uh, and, and our colleagues also who, who work more closely in that do agree that this is, is a, a very hard time. But we do think, uh, or we do hope that our graduates will have the, the knowledge and the, the reflection the, or the, the, the skills to reflect uh, mm. and to, to tell people why uh, a certain a certain quality is, is, is necessary. Mm. And, and we do think there is a, a huge market in audiovisual translation. So it would be, it is something that um, I, I assume that um, many of our or future graduates will find work in and mm. we want to prepare them well. But yes, we, with the, the self-confidence that Gary mentioned earlier and with the tools to sort of uh, not just do the work, but also mm. Mm. Uh, develop some of the new ways or how it has to be done. Mm. Mm. I think um, with a ABT, just a, an interesting example, I think um, if you can make, get your message across, um, then companies, TV companies for instance, TV, uh, the TV station for instance, Swiss, Swiss TV, um, they, they work together with us because many of our graduates ended up um, as so-called re-speakers with them, they ended up working together with us. And actually, you know, what's happened is many of our graduates are ending up working for Swiss uh, Swiss television. And what's happening is the the actual status of this division, this subtitling division, this re-speaking division, this um, audio description division, is being upvalued. And increasingly, this. The Swiss television stations begin to recognise the value of this and paying people properly for this. I think it, but I fully agree that again, you know, the general market is very depressed for translation. And I, I go back to what Martin said. The problem is that translation is viewed as a commodity. You're paid by the word in many cases. You're paid by the product. You are not paid a consultancy fee, and I think that this is part of what we have to do. We have to show that translation is a service. It is not a product. And once we can do that, we can establish a slightly better status for the profession and better pay. This is what we're trying to do. Colleagues, it's a pity, but we have to end our conversation today. And probably that is the last question from Andrei Savchenko. In your opinion, what are the recommendations? What could you recommend to a non-professional linguist translator? How can uh, such a person uh, work in this uh, industry? Very short answer. We're just right now have in the middle of this continuing education program that is aimed at exactly people who have been working in the profession uh, successfully, most of them, but want to uh, acquire certain additional uh, skills, capabilities, uh, and competences. And um, yeah. Please do go around, uh, find uh, offerings for uh, this kind of continuous uh, education, professional development courses. Um, and uh, one big part at those things, other than just the content, uh, is of course the, the networking, mm -hmm. the sharing experience, and um, finding out that you're not the only one. But yes, um, do, do try to uh, fill in the gaps that you may feel I mean I assume that this question comes from somewhere or some, where you have the feeling that um, uh, some of some some knowledge or some some skills may be missing so go and find the right place to 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 get those um, 
those mm. skills. Yeah. Mm. And if I may uh, make a point, it is part of our mandate, it's part of what we have to do. <clears throat> but I know there are a lot of universities out there who are not offering continuing professional development courses or uh, continuing education courses for the professional market out there. And it's a huge market. Put it in your strategy. Do it. It'll be great. And you can learn so much for those, from those um, so-called non-professionals out there that can feed back into your programs. So I would say, yes, do that. It's, it's a very interesting area for us to develop. It's not always easy. It's, uh, there are costs involved, and sometimes you don't need your budgets, but it's ultimately worth it. Last word. Dear colleagues, as Irina has already said, we are uh, getting to the end, to the webinar. We haven't answered all the questions. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do with the rest of the questions. For the closing remarks, I pass the floor to Irina. Uh, after that, uh, Gary Martin uh, will have the opportunity uh, to have their closing remarks after the technical remarks from me will end the webinar. Dear colleagues, dear Messi, dear Kalpas, we ha it was very pleasant to talk with you. We've learned a lot. It's a great honor to work with you. And I believe that our listeners uh, completely agree with us. And I'd like to remind you that this uh, meeting was translated by Natalia Dormidontova and Ksenia Pershova, the graduates of St. Petersburg uh, School of Conference Interpreting and Translation. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs> um, I, I, I very enjoyed, I much enjoyed this. Uh, to tell you the truth, this is my first ever webinar and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you very much for, for providing the framework. Thanks very much to your excellent interpreters. Um, it was really top-notch work and I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much to all of you, especially to you, Alexander, for getting this all arranged for us. Martin? Yeah, I can only say it was um, a pleasure. It was a very good opportunity to sort of go back and reflect about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and presenting it. And the questions show that there's interest uh, in, in translator training, so we're very happy uh, to share that. And, well, thank you very much to everybody involved in the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Спасибо. Спасибо. Dear friends, I would like, first of all, to thank Gary and Martin for the wonderful, interesting discussion. I hope that everyone who was listening has learned something new. We know we have, because this is not the first webinar and not the first school we had a webinar with. But I'd like to remind you that here, our dialogue with the school is not over. This especially concerns those who will be watching us in the recording. Much more people will be, watch, will be watching the recording later because the time doesn't work for everyone. You do have the opportunity to ask a question. We invite you to ask your questions to the school on our website at the bottom of the page of the Discuss app, also in our Facebook group, and also in the video comments on YouTube. We will give the questions to our guests and you will get answers to them. The recording of the webinar will be published on our channel very soon. We'll be presenting a link to everyone who has registered to the webinar. And we will also invite all interested schools to collaborate. We are ready to invite everyone who have something to say and who want to share it with their colleagues. Our contact information can be found on the website so, dear colleagues, we will see you again at Transl Academy webinars. Thank you. <laughs>